This video is supported by Brilliant.org. Remember the discovery of the Higgs boson? It feels like a long time ago. It feels like whenever I talk about it, it was like a generation ago or something. It's like, yes, the Higgs boson exists and the Higgs field is a thing. We all know that. Yeah, that was six years ago. Six years ago! There's mustard in my fridge that's older than that. I think these days there are so many scientific advancements and discoveries coming at us so fast that it's easy to kind of get things lost in the melee. I mean, the Higgs boson, just remember what a big deal that was? This missing piece of the standard model, this particle that gives mass to all the other particles, it was like without this, the standard model was just like a Jenga puzzle missing an entire row. Physicists have been searching for decades for this proof, and it was only made possible by the immense particle smashing power of the Large Hadron Collider in Europe. But here's the thing. It should have been discovered earlier, like years ago, and in fact we should have made way bigger discoveries than that by now. Dark matter, gravitons, other things we can't even imagine right now. Because it was another particle accelerator that should have been built 30 years ago. One right here in the US, and one that would have made the LHC look like some kind of high school science fair project. What I'm about to say is probably going to come to a shock to many of you, but the United States used to be highly respected around the world. I know that sounds crazy. We defeated the Nazis in Imperial Japan, we split the atom, we went to the moon, had this big economic boom, invented rock and roll, and not a Kardashian in sight. In the early days of the Cold War, scientists flooded into the United States in search of that good old American dream and are spending on basic science. Thanks to that flow of money, the 50s, 60s, and 70s were a golden age of particle physics in the United States. We discovered several predicted components of the standard model, we made huge strides, and our high energy program became the envy of the world. But in a story we've heard many other times before, as the Cold War started to wind down, so did the spending for that kind of basic science stuff. It's almost like it was all just a big pissing contest with the Russians or something. It's because it was. New particle accelerators in Europe began to surpass what we were capable of here in the United States, and with some pioneering work done by CERN, it started to look like we were going to be overtaken in the science world. Unless something drastic was done. And that something was the development of a very big accelerator. Something like this had been talked about since 1959, but in the 70s it took on a renewed interest, especially an accelerator that used superconducting magnets which could direct the flow of particles without losing any energy to heat. This was the secret sauce that was going to put us back on top of the physics world, and as Reagan became president, many well-known physicists began lobbying for a superconducting accelerator. Leon Lederman, then director of the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, also known as Fermilab, envisioned a huge underground loop where particles could be accelerated to near light speed, then collided to produce high-mass particles as byproducts. Lederman called this idea the Desertron, and you know what? Stop laughing. It's the coolest name you've ever heard, and you know it. The idea took hold in a couple of high-ranking officials in the Reagan administration, including his science advisor George Keyworth, and they sold Reagan on the idea. Plans were drawn up for what became known as the Superconducting Super Collider, or SSC. It wasn't the most difficult sales pitch of all time. Reagan took over at the end of the 70s when there was a huge recession, and he believed in American exceptionalism, and he wanted to go out there and show the world by investing in big science projects like this. Now some of it was militaristic, like the Strategic Defense Initiative, which became known as Star Wars, but it was also spending on the, the United States Space Station Freedom. Now those are just two high-profile examples of dozens of projects that got greenlit during this time, one of which was the SSC. So in 1983, a central design group was brought together at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory to create this high-energy physics dream machine. They proposed an underground loop with a 52-mile circumference underground to contain the radiation from the high-energy collisions. It was originally budgeted at 2 to 3 billion, but it quickly increased to 4 billion as more realistic plans came in. Ambitious, yes, but it was a giant leap in particle science. Up to that point, the biggest particle collision ever achieved was 1.8 trillion electron volts, or 1.8 uh, TeV, and this was done at Fermilab in 1986. The SSC would deliver 20 trillion electron volts per proton. So in a proton-to-proton -proton collision, it would peak out at 40 trillion electron volts. That's a lot more. <laughs> like, that is a ridiculous jump in power. So why go so big with this one? Because the Large Hadron Collider was already in development by CERN over in Europe, and they were targeting 18 trillion electron volts. So if it was anywhere around that range, the SSC would have just been redundant. So it made sense to go significantly bigger. That, and, you know. America, yeah. The next question, of course, is where do you put such a monstrosity? 
Well, it turns out a lot more people are willing to host a monstrosity if $4 billion come along with it. 43 states competed to host the SSC, but the winning site that turned out was Waxahachie, Texas, which is like just right down the road from me. It was chosen because the geography was good for tunneling and also just easy access to a major metropolitan city and all the amenities that come with that and the international airport. Plus the locals were really inviting. Some of the candidate cities actually saw protests against the SSC. The locals often had sort of a not in my backyard attitude about it, even though the politicians are really gung-ho about it and all the money that it would bring in. But uh, in Texas, they, uh, they basically got a welcome parade. A parade that was hosted by this guy. For those of you who are too young to know who he is, his name is H. Ross Perot. He was a Texas billionaire and a one-time presidential candidate. And uh, yeah, he was like a meme before memes were memes. Perot threw his considerable backing and support behind the SSC before running for president as an independent in 1992, a move that ironically kind of doomed the project. Because by running as a business-focused independent, he kind of split the conservative vote just enough for Bill Clinton to become president, and Bill Clinton had a different view on how science dollars should be spent. You know, while Reagan and Bush were all about basic science or science for the sake of science, Bill Clinton was more about applied science or science that had some kind of specific goal. He was also under a lot of pressure to reduce the deficit that had kind of exploded during the Reagan-Bush years. But the project was well underway. By the time Clinton was inaugurated in 1993, tunneling had already begun in Waxahachie. By that fall, nearly 2,000 people had moved into the area, scientists and engineers, to work on the project, and they'd already tunneled 14.6 miles of tunnel. Unfortunately, in October that year, the Super Collider was canceled by an act of Congress when the House budget refused to fund the project. Now, there's a lot of fingers you can point at different people to blame for the, you know, death of this project, but big science projects like this are rarely simple, especially in a big, messy democracy like we have. For example, when the site selection was being done, one of the contender cities was Chicago because Fermilab was already there, and they thought the SSC could just kind of like be a bigger version of what was already going on at Fermilab. Besides, a lot of Fermilab scientists were already involved with the SSC and the design and testing of it, and they already had the infrastructure there at Fermilab, so, you know, why not just make this an extension of that? Yeah, it makes sense. Of course, with $4 billion at stake, that argument didn't carry much water outside of Illinois. It's worth mentioning this because one of the biggest criticisms of the project was how it was managed. You know, outside the military, there just wasn't much precedent for a project of this scale, and one of the few that comes close is Fermilab. So the fact that they didn't capitalize on what was already there was... Probably a huge mistake. Now, another big gripe about the SSC was that it was kind of funneling money away from other smaller but also important science projects. Now, that wasn't true at the beginning when the Reagan administration was going all in on science projects. They thought that it would be paid for by economic growth, but when that didn't happen, Congress had to kind of tighten the shoelaces. Amongst a lot of other deficit control measures, one of the things that Congress did was pass an act that basically put a cap on science spending, meaning all the money that was going to the SSC meant less money going to other projects. And this was fine during the Reagan and Bush years when the SSC was a priority, but as soon as Bill Clinton became president, well, its days were numbered. And it wasn't that he hated the SSC, it's just he was new, a lot of people were complaining about it, and he didn't really have the political clout to, you know, overcome that. It didn't help that the budget for this thing was completely spinning out of control. I mentioned earlier that it was originally planned at two to three billion dollars and it had gone up to four billion dollars. Yeah, that was just in the planning stages. As construction became real and improvements were made to the magnet design, the budget ballooned to eight and a quarter billion dollars, with some projecting it to go up to ten billion dollars. That's a lot of important projects worth of money. And it became increasingly hard to justify cutting programs, some of which had a really important and specific goal in mind, for a project that was huge and massive and, well, we didn't know what we were going to find. I mean, <laughs> that was kind of the point. And the project that was arguably the biggest culprit in the death of the SSC is something you probably don't want to hear. The International Space Station. Space Station Freedom was the original name of the space station. I mentioned that before. It was a 100% U.S. controlled, U.S. owned project, but when that Reagan money stopped flowing, they had to get a little bit more creative. So NASA partnered up with international space agencies from around the world and they were able to make it happen, renaming it the International Space Station. But doing the same thing with the SSC is a bit more tricky. I mean, one thing is just geography. You know, the International Space Station floats around the Earth. Every country has equal access to it, whereas the SSC was gonna be deep in the heart of Texas. Plus, most European countries were heavily involved in CERN and the Large Hadron Collider, so they already 
kind of had something that they were working on. Russia hemmed and hawed about it, but they were kind of busy with the whole, you know, collapse of communism and reorganization of their entire society thing. But the closest fit was Japan. This is where there was actually a glimmer of hope for this project. Japan's economy was booming, and if we could form a strong partnership with them, maybe we can make this happen? We were basically the mom at the office that had one last box of cookies to sell for her kid's fundraiser, and Japan was the only manager that we hadn't asked yet. Except we had asked. We'd been talking to Japan about this from the beginning, actually, and they always seemed to kind of yank the football away at the last second. One of their biggest gripes was some of the import quotas that we had on uh, foreign cars as a little political move to try to boost domestic auto production. Obviously, this wasn't good for the Japanese auto industry, which was just starting to get a foothold in the United States at the time, so that was kind of the quid pro quo. That was the, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours kind of thing. Of course, it's not that simple politically in the United States when the auto industry is struggling and they know that opening up the floodgates to Japanese cars would just kind of come in and take over. Big auto probably wouldn't like that and neither would their lobbying money. This was a deeply entrenched and difficult situation. Entire summits had been convened between the United States and Japan to try to find some way, some maneuvering that would make all this possible. And in 1992, at a specific summit, the SSC was on the agenda. This was going to be the meeting that determined the fate of the largest particle physics experiment in human history. Untold sums of human knowledge hung in the balance. And this happened. That's U.S. President George H.W. Bush at a state dinner hosted by Prime Minister of Japan, Kiichi Miyazawa. And that is U.S. President George H.W. Bush puking on the Prime Minister of Japan, Kiichi Miyazawa. And that is the story of how some bad sushi killed the largest particle physics experiment in human history. Look, if we're being honest here, uh, it wasn't sushi. The doctors blamed it on a bad mix of medications that Bush had been on, plus travel exhaustion. And it also isn't like the Prime Minister of Japan got puked on and was like, that's it, the SEC is done. It's just they were now concerned about Bush's health and wanted to kind of get him out of there a little bit quicker, so they had to drop a lot of things from the agenda, and the SSC was one of those things that got dropped. Regardless, Japan did not become a partner, and from that point forward, the SSC was just a dead man walking. At this point, the whole project just became a political punching bag, you know, a prime example of pork barrel spending, a boondoggle that just kept getting bigger every time you looked at it. Of course, the scientists who understood it saw it as the particle physics equivalent of putting a man on the moon. Of course, putting a man on the moon is much more inspiring to the general public, and there is a very specific goal for that, putting a man on the moon. It's kind of right there in the name. Regardless, by the end of 1993, the last $640 million on the project's budget was being spent to shut everything down and find new jobs for all the engineers and scientists that were working on it. So what did we miss out on, on this? Like, how big of a loss was this? If by we, you mean the United States, well, I mean, we're not the biggest and baddest, are we? If by we you mean humanity as a whole, well, there are some people that think that we could have found the Higgs boson in the early 2000s instead of 2012. I mean, that would have been nice. But of course, it's really about the things that we haven't found yet, you know, things that might lie outside the capabilities of the LHC that the SSC might have been able to actually see, like maybe the graviton. There's a puzzle in particle physics known as the hierarchy problem. Basically, gravity is the weakest of all the fundamental forces, and ridiculously so. Like, all the other fundamental forces are, like, right up here, just kind of hanging out, making sense, and then gravity is, like, way down here. The difference is these guys all have a force carrier particle associated with them, and gravity doesn't. At least, not one we've been able to find. Being able to find a force carrier particle for gravity might put them all up at pretty close to the same level. And if you can do that, then you could probably tie them all into one force. A grand unifying theory, if you will. Gravitons would be a game changer. It might open up answers to dark matter, dark energy, uh, maybe give us a whole new picture of reality as we know it. Or if you want to keep getting crazier with it, if we can find a graviton, we might find a way to manipulate it. And if you can manipulate a graviton, you can manipulate gravity. You can control gravity. That would be the ultimate form of propulsion. We could just fly anywhere we wanted. That sounds fun. Yeah, that's basically what the world would be like if the super collider had been built. All those people 100 years ago that made predictions about 2020, yeah, they would have been right. All their wild predictions would have come true if only the super collider had been built. <laughs> the truth is, we don't know. But it's not like we're done, you know? It's not like we'll never get there. There are some plans and things in the works that could possibly get us to that point. 
One is LHC itself. It's actually been down for the last few years making improvements in its luminosity, which might actually give it some new superpowers. Luminosity is basically the sensitivity of the equipment. You know, I talked a lot about the, the power part of it, how many, you know, trillion electron volts of power that can be generated, and that's important, but the other side of it is the sensitivity of the equipment, the being able to track the motions of these particle debris that fly around. Uh, that's pretty important as well. And actually, if it's any solace, the LHC always had this over the Super Collider. It was designed to have 21 times the luminosity of the Super Collider. So a lot of experts actually think that functionally their abilities might have been about the same. Plus the LHC's luminosity has been improved on multiple times and this new iteration of it is actually going to give it 10 times more luminosity than before and increase the power by 1 trillion electron volts. So, I mean, that's progress. Now beyond that, there's the Future Circular Collider, which is another CERN project that they announced this last January. This is gonna be a 100 kilometer particle accelerator with the potential to Hulk smash atoms at 100 trillion electron volts. And they seem to have learned from one of the biggest missteps from the Super Collider. They're actually gonna build this on site where the LHC already exists so they can kind of take advantage of that already existing infrastructure. And China has a similar 100 kilometer collider that's in the planning stages at China's Institute of High Energy Physics. Both of these projects are expected to go online sometime in the 2030s. So just keep taking your vitamins and God only knows what we'll all get to discover. Just a quick personal note, I, I hope you like this video. It's a little bit different from what I normally do, sort of like an interesting history kind of thing, but uh, it's not at all what I wanted to do with this. The Super Collider, like I said, it's literally right here in my backyard. Like I remember being in college, it was a huge story back in the day. And I really wanted to interview some of the people that might have worked on it, that might have planned it. Um, I wanted to go to the site and record, you know, where they'd done some of the tunneling. I heard that they actually filled in the tunnels with water, so it's not like I could go down there and explore, which would have been really cool, but I could at least, you know, go there and find the spot. Anyway, it didn't quite work out the way I wanted to, but if that's something that you guys would be interested in, um, I am looking at doing some bigger, longer form documentary type projects in the coming year, so this could be one of them if it's something you want to follow up on, just tell me down in the comments. Now one thing I didn't really even go into in this video is uh, what exactly these particles are. They're being smashed at these particle accelerators. Ultimately, that's what this is all about. So if you would like to learn more about that, I can highly recommend the Quantum Objects course on Brilliant.org. In this course, you'll learn about the physics of the small, mastering the different measurements of particles like spin and charge, particle wave duality, and the equations that guide it all. It also breaks down some of the ways that quantum particles are able to enable advancements and everything from space travel to medicine. This is of course just one of hundreds of courses you can take on Brilliant.org covering everything from basic math concepts to computational biology, all done with fun, interactive puzzles so you can learn it in a way that makes the most sense to you. And they walk you through the process, starting with easy and basic stuff and going up in complexity from there. Viewers of this channel can get free access to their weekly puzzles and brain teasers if you go to Brilliant.org slash Answers with Joe. And if you like what you see and you want to sign up, if you do the premium subscription, it'll give you access to all their courses. You can get 20% off your subscription for life. They've also got daily challenges that you can play with every single day. They've got downloadable courses so that you can take it with you while you're traveling. It's a lot of fun. If you haven't checked it out, go do so. Brilliant.org slash Answers with Joe. Links down below. Big thanks to Brilliant for supporting this video and a huge shout out, as always, to the Answer Files on Patreon that are building a nice community, helping me to grow a team, and just doing awesome things for this channel. I do appreciate you guys so much. There's some new people. Let me murder your names real quick. We got uh, Daniel Thompson, Johannes, Sphere Slip, Dean, Jordy Fitzgerald, John Speaker, uh, Travis Aiken, Michael Monahan, and Kristen Erickson. Kristen Erickson. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get early access to videos, join an awesome community, and just be overall cool, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Patreon.com slash answers with Joe. I know. Eh. T-shirts available at the store with answerswithjoe.com slash store. Um, still time to get these things in for Christmas gifts if that's the thing that you do. Um, there's all kinds of stickers, posters, mugs, hoodies, you name it. Fun, nerdy stuff for the nerd in your life. Uh, answersyourdough.com slash store. Go check it out. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, Google thinks you'll like this one too. Maybe go check that one out. We got others on the side over here that Google's probably suggesting. And I invite you to go check those out. And if you like them, please do subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday and Thursday. All right, I think that's it. You guys go out, have an eye-opening rest of the week. And I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.